My name is Laura Mitchell, and I am the Executive Director of Visions Art Museum. Uh, delighted to have you all here with us today. I'm joined by my colleague, Rebecca Deep. Rebecca, you ra raise your hand there. Um, as well as uh, several of our QV 2020 artists who are going to share with us about their works that were selected uh, during into this um, fabulous show. We're really honored to have this group here today. And then as you are probably aware, we have another group tomorrow and another group on Friday. So we're going to be able to enjoy uh, really, really exciting um, insights and conversation um, for the next couple of days. Thank you so much. Um, we are of course disappointed that Quilt Visions 2020 uh, is not up on the walls uh, physically anywhere. Um, we are in the time of COVID and so we've done our very best to make this a really meaningful experience for everyone. We hope that you've enjoyed the online gallery and the ancillary materials that are there. Uh, and we hope that you enjoy these conversations today. And uh, while we certainly wouldn't wish COVID on anyone, I can truly tell you that the silver lining is that we're reaching more people with this exhibition than with any prior juried biennial. Uh, so it's very, very exciting um, in some ways. So uh, as uh, once this is all over and we're back to being a full, fully functioning on-site museum, uh, this isn't gonna go away. So the staff, when we talk about the future, we talk about what is it going to mean to run two museums? Um, because this online experience has been rich and powerful and allowed people from around the world to participate. So it's not going away. Um, so planning for the future, and we look forward to having you be a part of that as well. For those of you who have just come in, um, if you're not on today's speaker panel, if you could uh, mute your microphones and we are recording. So if you don't want your face to be visible, if you could take your video dark. And with that, Rebecca, I think I'll turn it over to you and I'll mute myself for the duration. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, what we are doing today is we are trying to replicate, if you've ever been at one of our openings, um, when we have the artists rotate and stand by their piece, say a few words, the opportunity for guests to ask a few questions. We are trying to replicate that today in the virtual world. And instead of a museum full of people, we've got 88 people currently in the room able to participate. So we're really excited by the expanded opportunity to share this with everyone. Um, and Laura has already told you about muting and keeping your camera dark if you do not wish to be seen. That is so, for example, we will not hear my cat behind me asking for food in about five minutes um, in the background of the recording. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you all, um, after the artists talk a little bit about their work, we're gonna have the opportunity for you all to ask them your questions if you have them. Um, we'll take as many as we can and if we are unable to take all of the questions, you can go ahead and send them to us. I will put an email at the end and you can send me the questions and I will relay them to the artists for you. Um, we will be using the raise hand feature to um, allow you to ask your questions. That will be, if you go to the bottom of your screen and you see the participants, it is two little people's shadows and it says participants under that, you will click on that and you will see a list of the participants and at the bottom are a series of buttons. One of them says raise hand and you can click on that and it will raise your hand. It should put a circle around it when your hand is raised. If you wanna take your hand down, you can click on it a second time and it should take your hand down. Okay. And we will be going through the artists um, alpha, in alphabetical orders um, by last name. And let's see, we can go ahead. If Laura doesn't have anything to add to that, um, I will go ahead and turn this over to the um, alphabetically first artist, uh, Bobby Ba. And Bobby, I can go ahead and screen share your piece of art now, if that's okay. okay. Sound good, you can hear me? Yes. So. Well, first, I want to extend sincere thanks to Visions Art Museum and Rebecca and Laura and the staff 
you have just gone all out gangbusters to do everything you can to get this exhibit in front of people. Thank you. It's really an honor to be a part. This is Look Through to the Memory. I created it in 2019. It's about 42 inches square. And I hope the first thing that happens when someone looks, is that, looks at this is that they say, this feels dreamy or this feels like a memory. It has an ethereal quality. If so, then I accomplished what I was going for. Um, there are two themes that have intersected in this work that have interested me for several years. One is the personal journey of a young girl or a young woman, the stages that we go through, how you develop your sense of yourself, how you feel connected to the world. It's not specifically an autobiography of me, but certainly, you know, I was a girl, I was a young woman, now I'm older than a young woman, and so I have been through a lot of things, and so my heart is in this. Everyone, though, will bring their own story to it and see what you see. Uh, so, of course, there's a little girl in the story, but she doesn't jump out at you right away. You see other things first. I've also been interested in a series about home and the architectural elements of home. So here I haven't got the whole house, but I've been interested in the window. There's the big window in the middle and then patterns and shapes of windows throughout the piece. Uh, I'm a collage artist, so all of my works are collaged to the background. I print all of my own fabric. It's either hand printed or hand painted, and I put it on there physically in layers, and that allows you to go into the story through layers because, well, that's, that's how memories and dreams work. There are things next to each other that aren't like they are in the real world, but they're like they are in memory and dream. Anything else? Oh, one, one thing, um, oh, go ahead, I'm done. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to get to my, um, my unmute button and I accidentally clicked ahead on a slide. Yeah. Um, I, I was hoping to ask you um, a, a little bit about your planning process. Do, uh, do you use a sketchbook to plan the, the shaping of your work and the composition? Yes, yes, I am a planner. And so I had three or four different variations of where the main elements would go. I printed the fabric specifically for this piece. Uh, and then of course, there's always extra stuff that I have printed from other pieces that are in the stash and you can incorporate and put in there. Um, but then part way through, things didn't work out the way I had planned or I saw something that I didn't know at the sketchbook stage. So I do plan, but then almost invariably, whether I want to or not, things change about halfway through the process. <laughs> and one of the changes, for example, was the number of trees. I hadn't known I would use trees at all or how many I would have. I thought they became an important element as I went along, but I really didn't have those uh, as much part of the imagery in the sketchbook stage. Let's see. Um, Laura, if you're letting me go ahead, I see Linda Chase has a question. Linda, you want to go ahead? Linda, you're muted. Okay. Because you, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you collage your fabrics one on the other, I wondered, um, what the maximum thickness is of those layers that you can work with? They're probably about the thickness that a quilt would be if you put them together in some other way. If you used misty fused or you just held your layers in position with pins and then stitched, you know, there's a, I use a polyester felt as my middle, the middle of my quilt sandwich. Uh, my only fabrics are natural unbleached muslin and a sheer polyester. You see the qualities of the sheer, for example, inside the window panes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do stitch through my collaged works. No, you never want to do that when the glue is wet. That would make give a very unhappy sewing machine. Um, and I have a very small sewing machine. So every inch of this is quilted, but I do work in sections and then I put them together. Thank you. Rebecca, if 
if I could just interject, um, I think the easiest way to handle the questions will be if people do use the raise hand function. If it goes into the chat, it might go by too quickly and we might miss it. I have just put an email address into the chat box so that if we don't get to your question, you can email it to Rebecca at curatorial at visionsartmuseum.org and we will endeavor to get those answered. Um, but I think our, our best way is gonna be using the raise hand if that's okay. And the next question then would be from Nancy Gonzalez. Do we have time for that at this point or do we need to move on? You're muted. You're muted, Rebecca. Um, I, I would like to keep the artists to definitely no more than 10 minutes, but five-ish per, five to seven per artist. So we've got time for oh, at least one more question. Okay. And I'm going to go to, to Nancy, if you could unmute yourself, you're up next. Yes, thank you, Laura. So sure. I have a question about the trees. It looks like some of them are um, various levels of um, opaqueness and um, they seem to be all the same tree. Are they screen printed? Are they painted? Are they collaged? How is that happening? They are all created with acrylic paints all of my imagery is created with acrylic paints. So that's how I print the fabric before I assemble the piece. And also once the piece is assembled, I will frequently put acrylic paint on the assembled um, quilt. So yes, they are the same tree. And it is, uh, I use a hand cut stencil. I am a very low tech kind of gal. <laughs> Um, I'm not against high tech methods. I just use low tech in most of the time. So I have a hand cut stencil of that tree and I put acrylic paint through it onto the composed quilt. And in some cases I mixed my acrylic paint with acrylic medium so that then it was a transparent paint. And where I haven't done that, where I use it full intensity, then we have an opaque paint. And you can see pretty much three variations on the left, the darkest, just to the right of that, the lightest, and that down in the lower right corner, sort of a medium. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank uh -huh. you, Bobby. Let's go ahead and uh, one last question from Karen Malin, and then if anyone else has any other questions, we'll, we'll go ahead and send those to the email. Um, thanks. You kind of alluded to that you use a, a fabric glue to hold them together. What, um, you know, what product do you use for that? Well, because I use acrylic paints, all of my collaging is done with acrylic medium. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with acrylic paints or mediums, but um, acrylic medium is the clear goop to which right. you add pigment to make acrylic paint. So it's like the base that acrylic paint is made out of, but it's clear. So it functions as a glue. It also, oh, okay. functions, you, it also functions to mix in with your paints to make it more transparent or if you had a need to protect your surface and varnish over it, you can do that with acrylic medium also. Okay. And, and okay. so it is archival. It's as archival as the paint itself. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh -huh. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bobby, for sharing that with us and oh, my honor. questions. And um, let, let's go ahead and uh, keep going. Our next artist in alphabetical order is Linda Beach. So let me go ahead and bring up your slide, Linda. Okay. And is Linda muted? Linda Beach? Can you hear me? Ah, mm -hmm. I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, and first, I, I wanted to echo again, thank you to everyone at Visions and, and for all your hard work and, and for making this such a wonderful online experience. And I'm truly honored to be in the company that I'm in. Uh, this is my piece, I call it Fall Confetti. I completed it in 2019 and it's approximately 48 inches square. And I work almost exclusively on the subject of trees. Uh, I'm fascinated by trees. I'm an avid gardener. Uh, I spend a lot of time outdoors hiking and bicycling and trees are just a passion of mine in so many different ways. 
I love the shapes. Um, I, I just love portraying them at different seasons. I work exclusively in a piecing technique and I love the challenge that piecing demands of me when designing. And I also work exclusively with commercial fabrics. And that's the other half of the challenge that I enjoy is finding exactly the right commercial fabric that conveys what I want to. And I do not do any surface embellishments. I do not paint. I do not do any stitching aside from a random quilting stitch to keep my layers together. I construct it in a um, traditional way with a backing and a batting and then my top layer. Um, but I like to keep it very simple as far as technique. So I enjoy finding perfect fabrics. I have a huge fabric stash. And then of course with piecing, it does limit the shapes and the lines that I can use in my designs, but I enjoy that limitation. And this particular piece, uh, sometimes I work from images that I see or vaguely from a photograph, but sometimes as in the case of this particular piece, a fabric itself will inspire me. And in this case, it's the fabric that makes up the ground with the multicolored uh, shapes on it. From that fabric, um, the rest of it just came to me and I worked from my imagination on this. Ah. So um, as questions start to roll in, that, that starts to answer my personal question for you, uh, which was, because looking through your pieces, your work in general, you, you, you often have very deep space, um, the, the imagery of nature, it, it looks like it might be perhaps based on photography. Do you start from photographs or is everything purely from your imagination? Sometimes I'll take photographs. I don't usually do pieces from the photographs. Um, when I first started out, I, I, I did some that were fairly faithful to photographs but I haven't done that for years. I will take photographs if I see a very interesting shape of a tree or maybe a particular bark pattern that I will remember. So in a general sense, I might use photographs as, as notes for a future project. Um, but a lot of it, as in this particular case, it is strictly imagination at this point. Wow. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and, and everyone is welcome to raise their hand if they have any questions. Um, and while we're waiting for any qu other questions, um, I also just wanted to uh, clarify on your fabric uh, choices. Now, did you say that they are all commercially printed cottons? Yes. It, that's incredible, especially looking at the uh, orange and black stripy leaves that you've got up in the tree. Um, in, so that is completely just a find that you found uh, and it just works perfectly there. Exactly. They get, and to me, that's half the fun of, of finding. In that case, I found the perfect batik of these orange leaves on a dark navy background and, and just fussy cut it to the size and, and shape that I needed. So it's more like a treasure hunt to me. I, I enjoy that part of it. Linda, I like that term fussy cut. That's very nice. <laughs> I think that could apply to a lot of things. Um, and Rebecca, we have two people who've raised their hands now. So Stefania, if you'd like to like to speak, you need to unmute your microphone. And then uh, Paula, you'll be after that. Mm -hmm. When you talk about piecing, it looks so intricate. Are you doing paper piecing? Or what kind of, how do you piece things together? It's so unusual and intricate well, and delightful. I don't do paper piecing. I, I do the type of piecing where I draw my pattern and then I'm making the freezer paper templates. Oh, okay. So I've learned over time to try to make my job a little easier. Uh, this particular one is all straight line piecing, but I've learned to draw it and, and maybe take advantage of um, pattern and value and make it look like it might be more intricate or per Mm -hmm. perhaps maybe a, a more curved line than the pattern actually portrays. It's exquisite. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
Thank you very much, Stefania. Um, Paula, if you if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Linda. Um, you know, I wonder if you're working by section or did you draw the whole thing out? Is it one large pattern and then you piece it? It's one large pattern, but when I start designing, um, I, I generally do a rough sketch of, of the layout of my subject and, and think about values. And while I'm doing that very, very rough sketch, um, I'll start thinking about how to chop it up into sections. And then as I'm actually putting the paper out for the full size pattern, I will draw my sections at that point. And I've learned over time to try to put these section lines, um, hide them in more random areas. You know, they might not follow the line of the tree. They might go through the sky and then the tree. And that's when I'll use the value and the different colors of fabric to trick your eye and, and to hopefully make a lot of those lines disappear. But yes, it is broken down into sections that I can oh. work at a time and easily piece together. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Linda, thank you so much for that. Um, I think we're about out of time for Linda Beach now. So <laughs> once again, if you have any more questions, go ahead and use my email, which is in the chat. Uh, we will go ahead and let's see, our next artist is Betty Busby. Hi, everybody. This is not a virus. <laughs> <laughs> I share a house with my sister who's a pulmonologist and we are right in the middle of it. Um, so I, I wouldn't play around with a virus. Um, this is really a composition. Um, I have been working with circles for a long time. I love to try all kinds of different things with them. And this one is a shape that I drew up that, that it creates an illusion by different sizes of circles all mushed together. And the difference in this one from previous ones is I decided to connect them all with these lines. And the lines were added after the main shapes were, so I could, you know, fiddle around with them and place them. Um, and it's funny how differently all of us work. I am not a planner. <laughs> And I love tech. Um, <laughs> so these pieces are all cut out with a, an electric cutter and they are made out of a non mova material so they don't unravel. Um, a, it's called vertex. And in math, a vertex is the intersection of lines. So I thought that was pretty appropriate for this title, but it began with a big chunk of silk and hemp mix fabric and I procyon dyed it. So basically, if I were Whistler, this would be called a composition in gray and rust. So the colors of the motifs were chosen to complement the colors of the background. And basically, I like to work from the, the background, I'll put it up on the design wall, make a few motifs, move them around, make some more, move them around. So I'm very much uh, into improvisation. I think of what I do is much more uh, like a painter's approach than designing a quilt piece by piece. I, I like to change things and move them around as I go. So do you guys have any questions? Should I chatter onward or? <laughs> um, well, we do have a couple of questions so far. Rebecca Dickinson was the first one to raise her hand if she wants to go ahead and unmute and ask her question. Hi, Becky. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Uh, I took your class, I think in 2018. Of course I remember you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Golfy. Um, yeah, the, um, I'd have to tell you, I, I had my brother who lives in San Diego look at these quilts and, and he thought yours was the virus, by the way. I'll, I'll clue him in that it's not. <laughs> um, I, yeah, yeah. So you're connecting lines coming from each of the, the circular uh -huh. pieces. Uh -huh. the, are those also from the non-woven and then you just- Oh yeah, those are just extra scrap pieces. 
But you cut <laughs> them because early. it's not yeah because it's not mowing. You don't have to seam them. You don't have to do anything. You just cut right. them out, iron them down, and move them around till they look good. But yeah, yeah just they're just leftover <laughs> pieces. Yeah, yeah. But he's not idle. idle. Oh. <laughs> She's my she's my idol, so I have created a few pieces using her technique, and I ha and I bought a cutter. So, oh. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> well, it was yeah, of course I remember that was the QSDS, right? Right, right, um, right. It, right. It was great. It was great, yeah. and I and I love seeing your things. I I know you put up your work, and yeah. I love seeing that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, we've got a few few um, in the queue, Lisa. Zarnelli Golic, I for, forgive me if I mispronounced yes. your name. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Betty. Um, my question is: Is your concept reinforced by your process, or do you feel like your process um, influences the concept? That is a really great question, and the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. So so and. When I do series also, I'll do a bunch of ones and then I may come back to it years later. So basically, um, specifically when I started figuring out how to use the cutter, I'm like, I'm not gonna cut like circles or you know big chunks of things. I'm gonna cut out things that I can't cut by hand because it really isn't faster. It just is better than what I could do by hand. So, um, so the ability to manipulate the shapes in the cutter. So this is basically the same original drawing and it's stretched and it's flipped and it's reversed. So in that way, the process is influencing the design because I can reiter reiterate these shapes that make them all a little bit different. Um, and really, and get away with just using one shape for one, um, for, for one piece if I want to. So does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> OK, sure. OK, let's try. We'll, we'll definitely do at least one more. We might not, not be able to get to two more. Susan Bianchi, you want to go ahead with your question? Yes. Oh my god, I love this. Um, it looks to me like a couple of the motifs are lined. Do you do that? Or is that an illusion? Or um, is it just well, actually placement? yeah okay so yeah that's that's a, a very good observation so for instance in the lower right hand corner you see that the corner is um is kind of a crackled uh gray and black and then in that black shape is a crackled uh rust colored and white so that's basically where I didn't like the background or it didn't come out well, or I felt it added to the flow. So what I do is I um, stick the fabric lightly on the non-woven shape and I trim around. So the edge of the non-woven shape covers the, ed the raw edge of the material. And these are both silks that I crackled with um, uh, the, using wax, just like a batik. So you, you know, you paint the wax on or soak the wax in and crumb, crumble it up and paint. I'm using paint and then you just iron out the paint. So that is what I used uh, on the background of several of these uh, and on several other ones to get a better contrast. I just use different materials. Like there's two gray shapes in the upper center right that are lined with, that's actually a really light batik. Um, so they are lined with a really light batik because I'm always trying to pump up contrast. My um, mantra for fabric art is you really need to have value contrast. We're so attracted to the middle ranges of color that we forget to go all the way to black and all the way to white. So those two shapes, one is black and one is gray, but they're on a rust color background. And I felt to really make them pop, I should line them and make them stand out. So yes, a very good observation. That's I thought gross. I could get away with um, just, <laughs> oh yeah, this is how it grew naturally. <laughs> but yeah, those are lined, those are lined with different, different fabrics. 
Thanks. Okay, unfortunately, that is all the time we're going to have for uh, Betty Busby. Um, so you can send me your questions um, with the email in the chat. And then also, just to keep this program to not being too far over an hour for people that uh, need to leave. Um, but we can potentially, if the artists want to stick around at the end and you have your question, we might be able to um, get to them as sort of an after the event uh, thing. So let me go ahead. Thank you so much, Betty. I appreciate that. Um, coming in, Betty. Move on to Laura Fogg, please. Okay, here I am. Um, First of all, I want to apologize because I'm going to have to leave. I have to hang a show downtown pretty soon. There's people waiting for me. And also, thank you. This is really a lot of fun to get to hear every, you know, a lot more about everybody's techniques. And I just can't imagine how all of us could be more different, which is a hoot. So this one is one person's junk, dot, dot, dot. We know the rest of that story. And I'm a person who tends to do quilts that are primarily a message. And I'm an old hippie. I went through college in Berkeley and I'm a product of the beginning of the you know, recycling movement and the environmental movement. And I'm still really passionate about both. And I spent some time in Urban Ore, which is a junk store in Berkeley. It's a recycled houseware store actually. And I, I looked at these doors that were stacked up next to each other and they were just so compelling, you know, waiting for another purpose, but also just the sheer compositional beauty of looking through the glass panels. And I work with, there's a lot of hand dyed fabric. It's all woven fabric, except I'm also working a lot with plastic these days in the vein of recycling. Um, I'm using plastic bags out of my own recycling for quite a bit of art and having a lot of fun with it. So the, the window panes in these doors are actually layers of plastic bags from my recycling. And I use, um, there's no paint. I virtually never paint on quilts. So all of the texture and visual detail is made with layers of fabric. I tear it, I shred it. There's layers of cheesecloth in this thing. Um, yeah, and there's, a, I also use novelty trims. And when I rip fabric, I pull the strings off it and then lay those in to accentuate, you know, the aging grain of the wood and just have a lot of fun layering stuff. And, it's all raw edge collage laid down on the whole piece. I have to work as a whole because if I worked in sections, this thing would not come together as a composition. And with this technique, I can move anything anytime. So I, I start with photographs of places I've been or scenes that really move me in one way or another. So I probably had about six or eight different photographs and I just stuck them up on the, the wall near my uh, design table. And then I work freehand. I don't make, there's no patterns, there's no plan. And I, in my mind, I start putting these photographs together and, some, and they, I start tearing and cutting fabric and laying it down and then pretty soon something happens. So that's my story. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, do we have anybody who wants to um, ask questions? I see Marion Emerson, you have your hand raised. I, was that from um, Betty Busby? I know you had your hand raised for Betty Busby. So I'm not sure if she has a question right now. Um, while we're waiting for folks, uh, if anyone has a hand to raise, go ahead and do so. Um, so I would like to, you started off mentioning, oh, you know what, I will hold on to my question because uh, Simone Armstrong has one first. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering on the windows in the plastic, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I can hear you fine, okay. thanks. On the windows on the plastic and the layers, um, what kind of thread do you use on that when you're stitching? Is it monofilament and what size of needle would you use? Um, I, I don't use monofilament because it tends to stretch for me and it makes a mess out of everything. 
I use almost exclusively uh, variegated um, polyester thread. So it's, uh, um, oh my God, I'm not good at the numbers. I just take thread that I like. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And just but a regular it, needle? Yeah. Uh, and I use a sweet 16 for my quilting. And so that's got a big old fatso needle. I think it's a 100 size needle. And mm -hmm. it actually punches pretty horrendous holes and things, but that's the way that machine works. So that's what I do. And I tend to, um, I was trained as a painter, even though I don't like paint, but I like to use the thread as a sort of like a sketch on top of the quilt. So mm -hmm. I add a whole lot of details with the thread, you know, to accentuate, you know, details and edges, all kinds of things and shapes. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Simone. Um, I have another question uh, while we wait to see if anyone else raises their hand. Um, Laura, can you tell us about the figure that we see in the, in the mirror? Do you have any thought, uh, does, where does that come from? Oh, it's just, um, it's contributing to the story because my story when I saw these doors was imagining them to be repurposed. And that doesn't mean anything unless there's somebody who is repurposing them. So that's actually a reflection. This was totally unintentional. When I took the photo, some of the photos, there was my reflection in the glass and I couldn't resist it. So I ended up, that was a really interesting challenge to try to get the figure, the sense of it, uh, but still it had to be transparent because the figure was reflected on transparent glass. And I ended up using hand-dyed cheesecloth for that. I had this kind of, um, I tried black and it was too dense. And I had this kind of um, mucky, failed, brown, blackish cheesecloth that I had dyed and just put someplace hoping it would get lost. And then I found it and it was just perfect for this thing. So that's under a couple of, I think it's under one layer of plastic. And, and then the rest of the technique that I do is I, I use black tool over all this raw edge collage and then pin through all the layers and then sew on top of it and the tool stays there. Otherwise I could never hold all these little itty bits together. Now you know. <laughs> I do, thank you. Yes, I, I, it's, this is another one of those ones that I'm just, I really wanna see it in person because I wanna see this plastic bag that you used and just see <laughs> it with my own eyes. Um, I will have to wait till another opportunity. Um, oh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Laura, and thank you for well, taking thank you. time before you rush off to your next um, appointment. The next art event, yeah. The next art yeah. event, yes. Yeah. Thank you okay. so thank much. You. Um, let's go ahead and I will move to Valerie Master Flanagan. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, first, I wanna say this has been such an exciting experience. Um, listening in depth to all the artists speak. So they say turbulent times bring out creativity. So thank you, Rebecca and Laura for making this happen for all of us. So my work, this one is entitled Up and Over and I enjoy graphic design and I am a piecer. So I began this design with no planning. Um, I cut out black shapes and I cut out many, many shapes, many lines. And I started constructing it on the design wall with just black fabric. After I had it designed, I now had a black and white design. And then I added some grays because my whole purpose and intention with this piece was to look at depth and values, looking at what is the primary figure, what might be a secondary figure, what of the background did I want to stand out as a primary background and what background would blend in more with part of the figure. So that was my intention in this. And um, I cut out the black and white, I moved to the gray and then I added the color. And by doing that, um, Betty was kind of talking about how we can get seduced by color and that then we kind of forget about our values. But because I had this laid out 
with black and white and gray as the medium, then I had my values basically established between which areas were going to be light value because they were the white background, which were going to be dark because they were my black figure and which could be in the mid range. And so after that, um, I made a lot of changes. Um, I didn't intend this to look like anything realistic, but as I worked um, originally on the right side, the figures were not those bug figures, they were different shapes. And as I started you know, putting in the color, I said, oh my gosh, this kind of looks like a pod, some kind of bugs crawling up it. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna let them be that way. I'm gonna enjoy it and just hang in with this process and let it happen. Um, and then the final part was piecing all of it together, which I will say I do enjoy piecing. I like the lines that are created with the piecing seam line, but this piece almost made me pull my hair out. It was the most difficult um, composition I have ever pieced because of all the angles and the Y seams and trying to cut. And sometimes I had to cut through figures in order to make something um, doable to piece together. So that's that. Thank you so much for walking us through your, your fascinating process. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and raise your hand um, while we're waiting for anyone to raise their hand. Oh, Andrea McCall beat me to my question. Andrea, let's uh, hear your question. Valerie, hi. Hi, Andrea. This is, um, this is so different from the work that I've seen of yours before, is this a new direction or is it a series? Tell, tell us a little bit about the difference. Okay. Sure, um, it's, it's a new direction based on what you're seeing, but I have been, I've been studying with Nancy Crow for a number of years for the last 10 years off and on. And she, it was very much about having us create configurations and motifs. And I did do some of those but because I always like to maintain a strong focus with, with something I'm really into, I was very much into the work that you recognize me by and I didn't wanna get sidetracked very much. So I would say in the last three years, I have been working more with shapes and a collage type approach, but they've been in smaller works that I've taken to local galleries and um, a few have been out there, but not very much. And this is the first time I have sent one your way for your jury process, which was very exciting. Um, I, I must say I was uh, thrilled that this one was accepted because as an artist, when you start sending out work that's different than what some people recognize you by, it's, uh, it's making yourself vulnerable and it's mm -hmm. um, somewhat scary process. So I felt very supported in um, how this newer work, as you call it, has been received um, by different audiences. What an affirmation. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I, I know that um, Laura and I were just talking about this new direction for Valerie. Um, and so I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, Simone has a question for Valerie. Hi, Valerie. Uh, just Hi, a Simone. question on the uh, stitching. Is that match, sti match stitch quilting on it? Do you know what I mean about the, the eighth of an inch or something? I can't see it very well. Oh, oh yes, it's very, um, it's probably an eighth of an inch and sometimes less. It's very, very narrow, narrow quilting. Um, as I, I love quilting. And as I progressed um, through my artistry, I, I have recognized that the narrower the quilting, the more it appeals to me. Um, five or six years ago, I probably was a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. And mm -hmm. since then, I, the denser quilting to me makes the piece lie flatter and gives it a whole different dimension, which appeals to me. Yeah, for sure. Now, on the threads, do you use um, each color has got its own thread color or is, do you use, um, is no, it just I, one I, thread? I boldly select just one thread. Wow. And I love how it's it's like that color interaction that we learned about, you know, with um, 
uh, Albers and other other famous artists that you know as that color and I can't even tell you for sure I think it's like a gold color as it crosses through each of the other colors it looks different and I've had people look at um, work up close and be very surprised that it's the same color thread because it'll look different as it passes the tan versus the gold versus the red. Yeah, this is a very cool composition. I really like this. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for your questions. Um, and thank you, Valerie Master Flanagan, for telling us about your work. Okay. Um, this is just great. Um, and now let's go ahead on to Karen Rips with her piece, Perinatal Depression. I shouldn't say that with a smile on my face, perhaps. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for Rebecca and Laura for inviting me to talk today. I think it's really great to hear all these artists' talks. It, it means a lot. Um, I work in series. I've worked in series for probably 20 years now and mostly uh, emotional series. The first series I did with my friend Paula Chung was um, on uh, body imagery, x-rays, MRIs, that kind of thing. And then I went off on my own and did a whole series on loss. And now this current series is on uh, mental health, mental illness. And the first topic I tackled was depression, which is pretty common. And uh, this particular piece is perinatal depression, which can be depression before or after pregnancy. Um, I was a neonatal nurse and my daughter is a L&D nurse. And so this subject has come up frequently in our home, the topic. And um, we realized that seven out of Every, wait, one out of every seven women and one out of every 10 men suffer from this disease, which is unfortunately not picked up as yet too much. So anyway, this piece is constructed, I dye all my own fabric and this piece is constructed with a blue background. I use all cotton and um, the black and the white are both, Use, using a shrink, shrinkage type technique, which is using a very thin felt for the batting. And then you stitch it and then you throw it in hot water. And so for the white one, it was originally pure white. I dyed it black and then I bleached it back. To, after stitching it, I bleached it back, leaving some areas black and then just stitched it around. And my idea is that it's, it's trying to create a, a home, a unit, and there's another party coming into that unit and it can be disruptive and it can be disconcerting to everyone involved. So that was what I was trying to say with that piece. I, I really personally enjoy the, the variety of visual texture here and the sort of symbolism of this piece coming in and the tension that we feel um, with the, the discrepancy in size. It's, um, it, I almost feel like I'm able to identify with the, the, the state of mind. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions if you guys wanna raise your hands? Um, and while we're waiting for folks to raise- Rebecca? Yes. If I could, um, could, could uh, interject, I know some people have asked about the, uh, or have lamented our inability to see these up close to see really what the textures are doing and, and understand even the three dimensionality and tactile nature of, of these works. Um, if you go to the website, you can hover, hover over images and get a little bit um, closer up, but obviously not the same as being there. But, um, but we, we really worked hard with the online gallery to, get a, to enable as much of a close up as possible. Um, and in looking at this one, uh, Karen, I was really, um, I reacted really viscerally and strongly to the texture of the, the lighter field, so the yeah. almost white field that the rippling, in fact, it, it, it really evokes soft tissue yeah. in a way that I have to say was a little unsettling, <laughs> um, but I think it was important that it was unsettling. It was good 
to be unsettled by it and then to have to think about it and uh, reflect on it. Um, I'm really curious to know how you, how you, if you could just talk us through, since we can't sure. see it in person, I you used, could talk us um, through what, what that texture is, how you achieved it and what it means to you. I use a, um, it's not really a batting, but it's a wool fabric that's very, very thin. I get it in England, but I know that uh, Yoshiko Wada sells it here in the United States. Very thin, and that's my batting. And I so I stitch it to stitch the heck out of it in rows, as you can see. And then I throw it in hot water in the washing machine, and it shrinks it way up like that and gives you all those ridges that you get. And initially, when I washed it, it was black. And then I went in and took some thinned out bleach and just painted areas where I wanted more color removed and less color removed. So that that is the basic principle of this. So you didn't start with white fabric. I you did start with white fabric on the cream colored one. The cream colored one. I dyed it black. And then I stitched it and then I went back in with the bleach and the bleach turns it a kind of a cream color. Yeah. I didn't want it white. I don't yeah. I didn't want the bright white. So I usually end up doing that and I get kind of a creamy color going on. Yeah. Extraordinary. Thank you. And it's very tactile and it is a problem it shows because people are, people want to touch it. <laughs> we'll have to bring back the petting zoo, Laura. That's right. <laughs> Little scraps of fabric so people can touch them and not the art. <laughs> yes, yes, I've done that in the past, yeah. Um, I'm glad Laura asked for more information about that texture because uh, that is certainly the first thing I thought of when I looked at the piece as well was my goodness, how in the world did she do that? Um, and now we know your secret. Um, yes, that's fine. Wasn't mine to begin with. <laughs> um, Linda Chase also has a question. Linda? Linda, you'll need to unmute. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Yes. If the black circular section is also textured. Yes. Oh, it is. Black is also textured. Yeah. Yes. Both of them. Thanks. Uh huh. Okay. Now, I, that we have is time for one more, Rebecca. Marion's raised her hand. Um. Yes. Just enough time for one more. <laughs> Marion, please unmute and. So quickly, the background blue fabric is very painterly. And yeah, I use a credit card that. with a dye and a credit card to make that those marks. There you go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sure. Very lovely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So fascinating. So many interesting techniques. Well, that was so exciting to learn more about your piece, Karen. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time today and sharing with us. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and we've got two more today. Um, we've got Libby Williamson next. And Libby, I don't know if she's muted still. I am not muted, but I don't see my artwork, which is unusual. I, I am just seeing you, Rebecca. And- You might have me on spotlight view. Um, I'm not sure how that would be happening. Yeah, I don't know how. how Laura, can you confirm that you, you have her piece up on your screen? Yes, her okay. piece, piece is up. Um, it, if, um, can anyone else maybe send me a message, uh, type in the chat, can, you, can, can the rest of you see it? Yes. Good. Okay, well, I know what it looks like, so I can talk about it. <laughs> and I'm just looking at um, faces. Um, my piece is called Etiquette in Connecticut, and it is one of many that I have made using repurposed tea bags. And this piece is actually, um, it, it's very important to me right now, and especially with the uh, COVID um, pandemic and the quarantine, I began this piece while I was helping my mom pack up our family home. And she was moving to an assisted facility, assisted living facility where she's living now. So I was traveling a lot back and forth from my current 
state is California, back to my home in Connecticut. And I had prepared all the tiny little tea bags. I had done, I had first of all steeped all the tea and drank all the tea and dried them all and emptied them and collaged all of the, the fabrics on top of the tea bags and stitched all of that down. And then I had, I think I probably made about a hundred, or about, excuse me, about 300 different tea bags in that manner and then carried those with me back and forth for months when I was working and traveling. And I, I, I was able to work a lot with her at home when we were finished for the day packing and I would stitch on my little tea bags and she would be knitting in front of the TV and it was a really special time for us. And then after I had all of these um, small elements stitched, I added a lot of hand embroidery. Then I spent hours and hours manipulating them and laying them down and shuffling them around and rearranging. And my original concept was that it would be fairly symmetrical in design. And I loved the look of it. And I fell in love with that. But then I forced myself to look at it in a different way. And I did go ahead and mess up all my hell design and I changed the layout. And I'm very happy that I, um, that I, that I chose to go with the asymmetrical format that you see. Um, there is a lot of hidden meaning in this and it's a lot about my reflections on my childhood and my family, home, the neighborhood the misconceptions that I had as a little kid about who lives in what house and what's going on behind each front door and how almost as a kid, I would think that everyone else had a, a you know, a perfect childhood and whatever's going on behind that family home was perfect bliss compared to the other. So it has a lot of all of that in it. And the only reference that I um, will sh I'll share with you is in the bottom Let's see, in the bottom left-hand corner, I did, um, I did create a house. And that house is clearly a reference to my mom, to my family home, and to her new house and her who new home in the assisted living facility where she is now. Libby, thank you so much for sharing more about that, um, the, the meaning behind your work and the where it got the name. Um, it's so exciting to hear more about that. Um, if we have time, I'll ask a question, but we've got Andrea Bacall first with a question for you. Hi, Libby. Hi, Andrea. I don't have a question as much as a comment um, uh, about looking at this and listening to what you said, because what strikes me and what I love about it and what I love about a lot of the artwork that I am drawn to is the in and out there's the the um the layers the depth and that they change every time you look at it something else comes forward and something else goes back and it really relates to what you said about um your memories and how your memories may not have been what really what reality was and it just right. struck me that you somehow consciously or unconsciously created that kind of back and forth um, conflict and and change so I, it's a it's a really well a beautiful thank piece thank you very much I want to say that was completely purposeful but probably a lot of luck as well <laughs> um, yeah there are a lot of um, layers psychologically you know just you know in my in my thought process about this piece and it really is a is, um, very personal piece. My mom, I can't visit her now. I mean, she is stuck in her room alone and has been there for a year. And, you know, it, there's just all sorts of stuff going on. So um, anyway, I appreciate your, your, your comment about that and, and all of those layers, physical layers and emotional layers and visual layers as well. Microphone was muted. Sorry about that. Um, Linda, right. Chief, you've got your question next. I was wondering, um, Libby, 
Um, I love your piece. It's fun to look at. Um, really nice to look at because so many things are happening every time you look at it, you see something different. I was wondering about the overall size of the piece because I can't tell by looking. Yeah. And also the size of your individual pieces. Okay, about the, the entire piece is about 40 inches square. And I did use, um, I ended up using 196 finished tea bags. And each tea bag is about two inch square. I use the flat ones that don't have the string in the tag. So they're not the uh, kind of traditional Lipton style tea bag that looks like a house. These are more, they're almost square shaped and they're about two inches. And so then, you know, multiplying all that out, I've got about a 40 inch square piece in the end. Thank you. It's a lovely piece. Thank you very much. Um, all right, let's go ahead. We'll let, go ahead and uh, let Lori Booker do a quick question and then we will move on to our last artist. Lori, you need to unmute. <laughs> there. <laughs> so, Hi, Lori. Um, you had mentioned that you made a house in the left corner. And I see a house like on the left side towards the middle. Is there more than one house? Am I, am I, am I, I can't it? see my piece on the screen. Unfortunately, I must've messed up my settings halfway through our presentation. So I'm not seeing what you're seeing, but if you're looking at the piece on the bottom right corner. Okay. And I uh, see it. I see it. Okay. Yes. You found my, my, that's my mom's new house. That's my, I don't know what house it is, but she's a, she is a phenomenal quilter and is very traditional in her quilt pattern. Um, and so, you know, she made a bazillion traditional pieced quilts with schoolhouses and all of that. And so that really is a reference to all of that in many different layered ways. Okay, Libby, but I found another house too. I know there's so many hidden things in there. There, okay, you can keep looking and looking at and connect the dots in any which way you want, and you can make all sorts of cool stuff with this. Yeah, love it. Thank you, Lori. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Libby, for sharing about your piece. Let's go ahead and get to our last artist for today, uh, Hope Wilmarth. Um, but we're going to have to maybe start doing alternating which way we go in the alphabet or something. So <laughs> um, thank you, Hope. Well, I made this quilt uh, during a very difficult time in my life. My husband uh, was in hospice after undergoing a month of immunotherapy uh, that wasn't producing the results that we had hoped for. So I wasn't sure how my journey would unfold without him. I had met him when I was in high school and we were married over 50 years. So this quilt is called Uncharted. Uh, it's intuitively pieced and quilted. Uh, black and white is a comfortable palette for me. Uh, I find the absence of color to be, uh, make a, a statement on its own. Uh, there's a sprinkling of red throughout, uh, which keeps the eye moving, but in this piece, it, it means for me, um, my husband was a, a quiet, um, uh, thoughtful and gentle man, but he had a mischievous sparkle about him. And so that's what the red uh, reminds me of. The shapes uh, in this quilt provide places for the eye to look behind or in front of. Uh, some retreat while others uh, take sharp turns. Some shapes are inter, uh, energetic while others uh, are a place to rest. And thus is my journey. My approach in my abstract art is always improv improvisational. I sew small pieces together and put them on the design wall and just grow them. I, I always pay attention to shape and line, negative space and texture, and how those elements influence the design I'm creating. It's a liberating process for me. It takes a lot of time, um, but it always instructs me. So 
this is uncharted. And I will say that if you can see my picture, for some reason, the, the, um, the photograph image, the, the black is not as, as, as uh, sharp as it is in real life. Oh, interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing about that. This is definitely a piece that um, it, it's very emotional. You know, I feel your emotion when I when I look at the piece and when I read your artist statement. Um, while I wait for any um, questions that people may have to raise their hand, can I ask you about, so there is a lot of bold black and white shaping, but there's some areas with very fine lines. Is that printed fabric? How did you achieve that? Some of it is, in this piece I've used commercial fabric exclusively. Some, I, I do different processes. I've taken Betty's class, so obviously I would do different things. So this is all commercial. So some of the fine lines in there are um, already printed on the fabric. Uh, maybe my point, like that's already printed on the fabric. This is printed on the fabric and carefully um, cut so that uh, some of the lines show up and some don't. This piece in here is, is that's all one printed fabric. <sighs> It's like cheating. <laughs> you don't have to piece it. <laughs> well, there, there's so much piecing in this quilt. I, I almost was wondering if you had some sort of insane fine lines that you'd quilted in. Somehow. I do insane fine line piecing. I have, this is one of a series. Um, I started this series many, many years ago and I needed a comfort level when my husband was in hospice because I made it when he was resting. So uh, I, I wanted to do something that was a little bit familiar to me. Um, I do a fine line piecing that some people are more familiar with that has been in uh, Quilt National a couple of times. So yes, I do insane fine line piecing. Um, we've got a question from Judy Warren Tippett's next. And Judy, you might be muted. Judy, oh, there we go. Hi, Hope. It's nice to see you. Hi, Judy. Um, I um, was just um, very moved by this quilt, and I wondered if, when you felt finished with it, if there was um, any sort of relief you had or feeling recognizably further on your process, which must be so hard losing their husband that you, I know he was here a couple years ago with you. <laughs> yeah. um, well, um, yes and no. Uh, I knew when the piece was finished, I, I was done with it. Um, he had already died. I, you know, I, I needed to get it done and I, do, and I did get it done. Um, but uh, I think the grieving process, I think art helps the grieving process. There's no question about that. Uh, right now I'm doing a lot of charity quilts because it takes a lot of energy to create art and charity quilts for me are, are you know, less um, mind consuming. Um, but a grieving is such a process that uh, it, it helped, but it, when I look at it, I wonder, um, I don't wanna go back to that space and I have to say a year, a year away from his death is uh, that, that first year first is over and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I, I don't really know how to answer your question, mm -hmm. I, but I did know when it was done. I did no, no you, you were answering it and thank you. It's, uh, sh sharing all that personal is really meaningful. Thank you, Hope. Uh, thank you, Hope, and thank you, Judy. Um, Lisa zarinelli Gallic, you've got a question? Well, I just wanted to comment that I, having been through a tough year myself, I feel like the gray tones and the patterns in the white are about hope. Oh. I just feel that sense looking at the quilt. 
Thank that you. there's hope there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate it's so strong and having that element um, gives well, it a soft, a softening. I, I will tell you that um, um, my husband showed a, a huge amount of grace with his death. He, he decided when he wanted to go into hospice. And so it was helpful for our daughters particularly. And um, I have a minister daughter who immediately said, leave it to daddy to choose how he wants to die. And he did. And he showed us very much how to uh, die with a lot of grace and courage. So uh, I like that you saw that in there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. That is one of the wonderful things about art is that we, um, we all also have the opportunity to, to see what it means to us as individuals. Thank you both for that. Well, let's take one last question before I have a couple of ending announcements. Um, Stefania Bomarito, you've got one question for Hope? Um, yes, and this comes in with, I wish I could see this up close because not only the intricacies of all the pieces, but the quilting. And I can see where some of the quilt lines are in the white part in the upper right-hand corner. But how did you quilt this? Because you don't see the black and the white and the white and the black, on, um, it's the red lines. And I'm just so curious, how did you quote it? Because it's just very, intu very intuitively. I, I did not want to break the, um, in, in some of my work, I do uh, uh, use one color and just quilt straight through the black and white. And this one, I, I, I didn't want to do that. I want to preserve, I wanted to preserve the black and white. So the black is pieced before, it's quilted with black. There's a lot of stops and starts. Okay. And some of it is straight lines and some of it is uh, um, squares. Uh, there's no real rhyme or reason. Uh, it's just what moved me at the time. My, maybe my fatigue level. I did know I wanted to change my color thread in this piece so that um, the, the, the white planes were not interrupted with black thread. For some reason in this piece that made a difference to me. That you're quilting and the way you did it just adds so much more dimension and complexity to the whole concept. And, and you're right, you're caught up, like you're caught, what were your kind of thoughts and emotions at that moment in that square and whatever as you were going through the whole process? Because I understand the process, I've been there. Um, but yeah, I just, I wish I could see it in person because it's just got so much more to it than, than what we just see in black and white. It, that is true. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Hope, and thank you, Stefania, for those questions. And once again, thank you to um, the eight artists who spoke today, uh, sharing a little bit more about your quilts with us, your art, your inspiration, and your techniques. Um, as you can see by the attendance here, um, everyone's very excited to hear about it. And um, we had these eight artists today. Um, we've got events um, at the same time tomorrow and on Friday. Um, we've got Susan Bianchi, Lori Booker, Bonnie Bucknam, Paula Kovarik, Viviana Lombroso, Judy Martin, and Mary Powell tomorrow at two o'clock. And on Friday, we'll have Deborah Fell, Jill Kurtula, Paula Landers, Irene Roderick, Karen Schultz, Jan Tetzleff, and Charlotte Zebarth on Friday at two o'clock. Um, I will quickly try to get the links to register for those if you have not already done so and would like to attend in the chat. Um, you can also find those links, um, the email that you found the link for this event, you'll find the links to register for the Thursday and Friday events as well. So I will try to get those um, links here in the chat while I let Laura go ahead and do a plug for Interpretations 2021. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I have been busy letting people into uh, this event the whole time. People who have shown up late and were able to come and left and came back, um, just a testament to uh, how, um, how powerful this event is. 
Um, I got an email today from the Arts and Culture Commissioner here in San Diego, and he mentioned um, the importance of creativity, community, and culture as we navigate uh, this whole time of COVID. Um, and I am so grateful for the creativity and community and culture that we have at Visions Art Museum, not just the culture that we celebrate of visual arts, but the culture that we share um, as a community. This is a very special place and we're very, very grateful. Um, we have today with us uh, two people I wanna give a shout out to. We have uh, Melody Randall was with us today, who was one of the QV jurors um, for this year. Um, along with Emily Richardson and uh, Nancy Bavor. And also Carol Sebastian Neely is here with us today. And Carol is coordinating next year's um, juried exhibition, Interpretations. And Betty Busby, one of the jurors for that exhibition is here with us today too. Um, if you are interested in uh, um, uh, submitting for interpretations that call for entries will go live early in 2021 um, and that information is on our website it's also um, posted with SACWA and in a couple of other places so if you have any questions about that though please don't don't hesitate to connect with us directly and we'll we'll get you posted in the right place um, and lastly I just want to mention that uh, as I said earlier we are keen as we move into 2021 to be running two museums keeping the virtual going as well as having a robust uh, in-person presence once we're allowed to fling open our doors again and welcome you. Um, and as we do that, I just really do from the bottom of my heart want to ask you for your help. Um, if you are inclined to make a donation to Visions Art Museum, we will gladly accept that. Please know that your presence really is present enough. We're delighted that you're here among us. Um, and also we, uh, we are always, um, grateful for the support that we receive, financial support we receive that allows us to uh, keep the doors open, both the physical doors and the virtual doors. So I'll ask you to contemplate that and, and to consider that gift. Um, and Rebecca, I'll turn it back over to you. Once again, forgetting I'm muted. Um, well, that's um, all I had for today. Just I wanted to make sure that everyone got those, um, those links for the, the other events on.